So from the world of hyperproliferative anemia, we are moving into hyperproliferative anemia. So what does hyperproliferative anemia mean? If you are actually checking out for your reticulocyte production index, your RPA has to be more than or equal to 2.5 to say that it is a hyperproliferative anemia or in terms of absolute reticulocyte count less more than or equal to 1 lakh 20 thousand per microliter is basically called hyperproliferative anemia practically you can take hyperproliferative anemia to be equal to hemolytic anemia but remember that hyperproliferation is seen with blood loss also so that is there but in, for the time being we are taking hyperproliferative anemia as equal to hemolytic anemia or hemolysis is what we are actually going to talk about so it's destruction of the rbc's that we are going to discuss before we see the diseases and all that, just basic fundamental points. Normal physiological destruction is dash and is mediated by macrophages of the reticular endothelial system. So, normal physiological destruction is always extravascular. So, there is no destruction happening in the blood and is generally mediated by the reticular endothelial system. The macrophages of the reticular endothelial system, which are predominantly seen in the spleen and liver. So, this is where the destruction happens and it happens after a period of 120 days. What are proteins in normal plasma that bind hemoglobin if there is intravascular or significant extravascular hemolysis is haptoglobin. So, haptoglobin is the one that actually speaking binds to hemoglobin whenever there is hemolysis and that when there is significant intravascular hemolysis or any amount of intravascular hemolysis, it will go and bind to the hemoglobin. And extravascular hemolysis, normally it doesn't happen that way. Only if there is extra amount of extravascular hemolysis, that haptoglobin will bind. So, the main point, we'll come back to that. The main point that we need to understand over here is that normal lifespan is 120 days. And because the marrow has the tendency to expand and expand, only when the lifespan falls below 30 days do you actually see anemia. From 30 to 120 days, you are not going to see anemia. And that is because of the anatomic and expansion of the marrow. That's almost like 6 to 8 times. And that is the reason why you are having so much, so much amount of reticulocytosis. So, if you are asking me when the RBCs are getting destroyed in a pathological way, if you are trying to see when the RBCs are getting destroyed, it does not initially manifest as anemia. Why is it not essentially manifesting as anemia all of a sudden? Because of the ability of the marrow to expand six to eight times. And that's the reason why whatever said and done, the most consistent feature of any RBC destruction is going to be reticulocytosis. And you know what is reticulocyte and all that we have discussed in the beginning. So reticulocytosis is going to be very, very classical. And because reticulocyte is a big cell, that's the reason why you always have MCV increasing because reticulocytosis is a cause for increase in MCV without microblastic change. So, MC will increase and it's a polychromatic RBC, correct? Polychromatic RBC. So, polychromatic RBC, MCV increasing, these are features of reticulocytosis. So, the most consistent feature of uh, uh, hemolysis or destruction has to be reticulocytosis itself. Let us see what can happen. So, normally the destruction is happening extravascularly. Suppose you are having a disease where there is intravascular destruction. So, let us see, suppose you are having a disease where there is intravascular destruction, what can actually happen? Suppose we have a disease where there is intravascular destruction, RBCs are being destroyed in the blood. So, there is considerable destruction that is going to happen. Wherever there is destruction, there is going to be LDH and intravascular destruction, there is going to be significant LDH increase. When RBCs are destroyed, what is going to be released? Hemoglobin is going to be released. Correct? Hemoglobin is going to be released. And this hemoglobin is going to come into the blood into the glomerulus and get filtered into the glomerulus and the patient will have hemoglobinuria. Part of the hemoglobin will be reabsorbed into the PCT and that will again come back when the cell sheds and that will result in hemosiderinuria. So, hemoglobinemia, hemoglobinuria, hemosiderinuria and this hemoglobin may be converted into methemoglobin. So, you can get methemoglobinemia. So, hemoglobinuria hemosiderinuria, LDH increase, methemoglobinemia, all these can be seen with the disease where you are having intravascular hemolysis. Most, most important thing that you have to understand is whatever hemoglobin that is being released out of intravascular destruction will be bound to this protein called haptoglobin and there will come a point when haptoglobin stores are going to get exhausted. That is why if you check for haptoglobin, that is the most specific thing, haptoglobin will be undetectable in a significant intravascular hemolysis. So, in a significant intravascular hemolysis, haptoglobin is going to be completely undetectable or it is going to be zero. 
Correct. Let us go to the other side, which is your extravascular. Extravascular hemolysis happens predominantly in the reticuloendothelial system, that too of the spleen. That is why in extravascular hemolysis, you are going to get splenomegaly, which is generally not seen in intravascular hemolysis. In extravascular destruction, this much amount of florid destruction does not happen. So, LDH is going to be raised, but you cannot put it as 3 plus. LDH can actually put it as 2 plus. Now, hemoglobin is being released and hemoglobin is being converted into heme and globin. Globin goes to the amino acid pool. Heme actually divides into iron and protoporphyrin. So, heme divides into iron and protoporphyrin and this iron is the reason why your ferritin levels are going to be increased in these patients. This is very very important because here if you are having blood loss that will result in ferritin going down because of iron deficiency. Here ferritin can actually increase. This protoporphyrin uh, gets converted into Biliverdin and biliverdin further gets converted into bilirubin. So, biliverdin gets converted into bilirubin. So, in an extravascular hemolysis, you are going to get hyperbilirubinemia, which is indirect hyperbilirubinemia. In an intravascular hemolysis also, when there are large amounts and large amounts of RBCs being destroyed, you are going to get large amounts of heme and that some heme is that going to come to circulation is going to break down into iron and protoporphyrin and you are going to get some bilirubin. So, jaundice is also there here, but I would say that is mild whereas here is going to be very very significant so you are going to get bilirubin increase from bilirubin you will be having uh, urobilinogen coming to the urine and stercobilinogen in feces so urobilinogen in urine that is going to be 3 plus in a normal person urobilinogen traces only you can see in urine and stercobilin in feces so this is basically what is going to happen in a patient with extravascular hemolysis so extravascular hemolysis so many changes are going to be there intravascular hemolysis so many changes are going to be there extravascular hemolysis the king is the spleen intravascular hemolysis it happens in the blood itself and in extravascular hemolysis you can see urobilinogen in urine stercobilinogen in feces indirect hyperbilirubinemia and he have to globin is going to decrease here also but it is not going to be undetectable like in a uh, what intravascular intravascular hemolysis so i think that part is very clear what happens when there is extravascular hemolysis what happens when there is intravascular hemolysis and quite a lot of conditions where there is going to be a common intra and extravascular hemolysis also we have to see so once we know what happens here let us try to just put up a classification and see so you know the destruction can happen intravascularly or it can actually happen extravascularly and we have seen the features and all that with respect to it let us try to classify this hemolysis so i have so many ways to classify hemolysis one way that i can use is inherited causes of hemolytic anemia versus acquired causes of hemolytic anemia so i can classify it as inherited causes of hemolysis versus acquired cause of hemolysis whenever i talk of inherited causes of hemolytic anemia three things come to my mind one is that you can have a hemoglobinopathy which is due to your globin part which can be a qualitative or a quantitative defect you can have a membrane cytoskeletal issue membrane cytoskeleton defect or you can have enzyme defects so membrane cytoskeleton defect or you can have enzyme defect hemoglobinopathies include your sickle and thal yes membrane cytoskeleton defects include your hereditary spherocytosis then your hereditary elliptocytosis ovalocytosis and all that enzyme defects include your t6pd deficiency pyruvate kinase deficiency and 5 dash nucleotidase deficiency so g 6 p deficiency pyruvate kinase deficiency 5 dash nucleotidase deficiency because the cell is purely dependent upon anaerobic glycolysis it does not have nucleus so no dna it has no mitochondria so no krebs cycle it has no r i mean ribosomes it has no protein synthesis so nothing happens it depends completely on the anaerobic uh, glycolytic pathway so these are the things which come under inherited acquired can be very easily divided into immune hemolytic anemia and non-immune hemolytic anemia so i can divide acquired into immune and non-immune under immune hemolytic anemia i can think of drug induced we'll again see that in detail allo immune which again we'll see but most most important is autoimmune hemolytic anemia so most important under acquired is immune and under that we are having autoimmune hemolytic anemia autoimmune hemolytic anemia again we have warm autoimmune antibody hemolytic anemia cold antibody autoimmune hemolytic anemia and paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria so these are the three things which you will again see in detail so warm antibody autoimmune hemolytic anemia cold antibody autoimmune hemolytic anemia and paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria
then we have non immune non immune means you don't have an antibody non immune acquired cause for hemolysis would include sepsis would include drugs and toxins all these things are there sepsis drugs and toxins are there but most important again there is going to be an entity called fragmentation hemolysis which is going to be a mechanical destruction of rbc so fragmentation hemolysis which we will have a separate discussion on prototype example being the tmas and all that four we can have paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria what we call as pnh so pnh is there fragmentation hemolysis is there drugs and toxins is there sepsis is there so this is one way of looking at it so inherited versus acquired clear i think there is no doubt so inherited these causes acquired these many causes right now let us try to draw some conclusions now what are the conclusions that we can actually draw from here the conclusions that we can actually draw from here are first conclusion is inherited causes of hemolysis inherited causes of hemolysis are all generally having some kind of an intracorpuscular defect correct inherited causes of hemolysis are all basically having a defect which is in the rbc correct so intracorpuscular is a word that we can use for inherited hemolysis so almost all the inherited causes you can see over here are having a problem within the rbc whereas the acquired causes the acquired causes are all basically extracorpuscular yes acquired causes are all basically extracorpuscular is there any cause which is acquired any cause which is acquired where the destruction is happening due to a problem inside the rbc all the causes of acquired you see all the causes of acquired you see the problem is all extracorpuscular antibody is coming from outside drug is coming from outside sepsis toxin is coming from outside anyway but the only acquired cause where you are having a intracorpuscular defect yes only acquired intracorpuscular defect is equal to pnh we'll see what is pnh very very important so all the acquired causes are extracorpuscular and all the uh, inherited causes are intracorpuscular the only exception to an acquired cause being extra intracorpuscular is pnh all the other acquired is extracorpuscular hope i am clear with that yes similarly all the inherited causes are intracorpuscular correct that is almost true there is one inherited cause which is extracorpuscular so only acquired cause which is intracorpuscular is pnh all the inherited causes are intracorpuscular exception so the only inherited cause which is extracorpuscular can you think of we'll again come to that is a atypical hus we will see that that comes under fragmentation hemolysis but under fragmentation hemolysis we have hus and one form of hus is actually inherited so to complement defect that is called atypical hus or what you can even call it as familial hus so familial hus is the only intra sorry inherited condition that has an extracorpuscular cause and pnh is the only acquired condition which has an intracorpuscular defect this is very important to know because there is a specific table like this. this is a table from harrison okay you can see inherited all of them have intracorpuscular defect the only exception being familial hus you can see all the acquired have extracorpuscular defect the only exception being pnh i think i've tried to do justice to the table rather than writing all the all the causes i don't think it makes sense correct now i can actually ask you do all the inherited causes have uh, intravascular hemolysis or extravascular hemolysis you look at all these causes the majority of these causes all the inherited causes basically have extravascular hemolysis sickle has extravascular hemolysis thalassemia has extravascular hemolysis hereditary serocytosis has extravascular hemolysis so all the inherited causes generally have extravascular hemolysis the only exception is acute g6pd deficiency acute g6pd deficiency where you can have an intravascular hemolysis otherwise all the all the inherited causes have extravascular hemolysis same way all the acquired causes if you see sepsis drug toxin all these things basically have intravascular hemolysis the only exception to that is autoimmune hemolytic anemia where you have extravascular hemolysis so that i think actually confuses you for once and all and that's the best form of learning here because you get confused and once you are confused i think things are very easy so we are going to have three modes of classification one is hereditary and the other one is acquired for the time being you study hereditary equal to three what are the three one hemoglobinopathies yes the other one is enzyme and the third is membrane cytoskeleton so hemoglobinopathies enzyme membrane cytoskeleton so these are the three which come under the word hereditary 
Correct. Under the word acquired, just two things to remember. One is immune. And under immune, you take one major heading that is autoimmune hematic anemia. And non-immune. Under non-immune, remember two words. One is fragmentation hemolysis. And the other one is PNH. So, fragmentation hemolysis and PNH. This is the basic background. Hemoglobinopathy, you have sickle and thal. Under enzymopathy, classical example is D6PD. Under membrane cytoskeleton, classical example is hereditary spherocytosis. Now, I am going to actually make four statements. These are the four statements which are being asked for the exam. First statement is, all the hereditary forms of hemolytic anemia have a intracorpuscular defect except. So, hereditary forms of hemolytic anemia have a intracorpuscular defect except. Okay, second question I am asking is, all the hereditary forms of hemolytic anemia have extravascular hemolysis except. So, what did you understand? So, hereditary forms have intracorpuscular defect except. Hereditary forms have extravascular hemolysis except. What do you mean out of that? Almost all the hereditary forms, sickle, thal, hereditary pseudocytosis, everything have a intracorpuscular defect and almost all the time the destruction happens at the level of the spleen. So, this is what we are actually talking of here. What are the two exceptions? Hereditary is intracorpuscular except your atypical HUS. Hereditary has extravascular hemolysis except acute G6 PD deficiency. These are the first two MCQs. Hope I am very very clear. Now, I will write the corollary of that which means acquired conditions are all extracorpuscular except. So, acquired is all extracorpuscular except. Acquired is all extracorpuscular except what? PNH. PNH is a completely intracorpuscular defect. The problem is in the complement regulatory proteins. Next, I am writing acquired has all intravascular hemolysis except. So, acquired has all intravascular hemolysis except because PNH has got intravascular hemolysis, uh, sepsis, trux, toxins, maha, everything has intravascular hemolysis except autoimmune hemolytic anemia where the predominant uh, hemolysis is extravascular. So, basically this is what you need to understand out of this. If you have the classification in your mind straight that you are having inherited and acquired and acquired is immune and non-immune, inherited is uh, equal to hemoglobinopathy, membrane cytoskeleton and your enzyme, then the rest of the things are actually speaking very easy. And this is what we will be trying to see in different different modules now. So, the classification is set straight. It is with this classification that we will be actually looking into different different modules. This term called familial HOS although mentioned in Harrison is to be taken with a pinch of salt because we are not using those terms right now. It is changed which we will again come back and see. So, this is basically the whole discussion. What happens to hemoglobin low? What happens to MCV? Increased MCH increase because of polychromasia, reticulocytes increase, bilirubin, indirect hyperbilirubinemia. What happens to LDH increase? What happens to haptoglobin decreased? LDH is more increased in intravascular, haptoglobin is more decreased in, ex in intravascular, uh, bilirubin is more increased in extravascular. So, this is basically what it is. Just to show you the hemosiderin granules. So, hemoglobin in plasma, intravascular, urine hemoglobin, intravascular, urine hemosiderin, intravascular, tissue ion increased, extravascular, ferritin increased, extravascular, LDH more intravascular, haptoglobulin decreased, that is intravascular, bilirubin increased more extravascular, splenomegaly seen only in extravascular. So, that I think pretty much uh, sums it up for a basic intro with respect to this. So, from the next module onwards, we will try and see individual conditions. So, see individual conditions in a bit of detail so that you understand where to place this with respect to the disease. Thank you.